As we look at the little book of Philemon, we've laid out the basic outline for this book. The first seven verses deal with Paul's appreciation as he thanks Philemon for the relationship that they enjoy one with another. And of course, Paul is laying that foundation because Paul has a great request to make of Philemon. Paul is not giving vain praise. It's not empty. Paul means every word that he says. Every word that he says is true. Paul is laying the foundation for the request that he's going to make. We see Paul's approach in verses 8 and 9. Paul approaches him very humbly. Paul approaches him beseeching or begging him rather than commanding him. He is pleading with him rather than pushing him to do what's right. And then in verses 10 through 16, we saw Paul's argument as Paul lays out the reason why Philemon ought to forgive Onesimus. And he talks about the fact that Onesimus is not the same man that he used to be. Onesimus was unprofitable, but he has become profitable. He also talks about the providence of God and how that Philemon left him, but now he's receiving Philemon back. And he left him for a season, but he's going to have him back forever. Not only is he going to have him back as a, as a servant in this life, but he's going to have him back as a brother and have a relationship with him for all of eternity. And so that's extremely important for Philemon to understand, is not only is he going to be together with Onesimus in this life, but he's going to be together with Onesimus in the life to come. And so it is important for him to be developing the right relationship with this former slave because they're going to live together in eternity. And in fact, they're going to bow before the same master in eternity. And so Philemon needs to have the proper relationship uh, with this slave who has been converted, who now is a brother in Christ. He's not to receive him back as a slave, but rather he is to take him back as a saint. Because this conversion has taken place and Philemon has to acknowledge that. Notice in verse 16, he says, not now as a servant, but above a servant. Now you might think that when Onesimus comes home, and if Philemon does, in fact, choose to take him back, that Onesimus is going to be taken back as a servant, and in fact, Onesimus is going to go to the bottom of the totem pole. Onesimus is going to become the lowest servant in Philemon's house. After all, the other servants have not run away. The other servants have not deprived Philemon of their service. And so Onesimus, if he comes home, you put him on the bottom. He suddenly becomes the lowest slave. The worst jobs go to him. But Paul says, no, you're not going to take him back that way. You're going to take him back as above a servant, and the reason you're going to take him back that way is because now he is a brother in Christ, and you have to acknowledge that fact that has to factor in to what you're doing in regards to him. He says, not now as a servant, but above a servant, a brother beloved. You've got to take him back as a brother, not just as a runaway slave, but now as a brother in Christ, especially to me. Now, I think those words are extremely important and interesting, and they're interesting for this reason. Paul has had time to build a relationship with Onesimus. And Paul says, he is my brother beloved. I've grown to love him. I've grown to appreciate him. Now, I realize that you have not been able to develop that relationship with him. I realize the last time that you saw him was when he ran away from you and when he left you without his service. I understand that relationship. I understand your relationship with him in the past has not been very good. But Paul says, my relationship with him is very good. He's a brother beloved. And I'm hopeful that over time he will have that relationship with you. That he will be a brother beloved by you as well. And so Paul understands that they don't yet have this relationship, but he's hopeful that they will. He says, but how much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord? He says, he ought to be a brother beloved even greater to you than to me. Because not only is he going to be a spiritual brother of yours, he's going to be a physical servant of yours. And so you ought to love him even more than I do because of what he's going to give to you, what he's going to render to you. You have reason to love him and to receive him back. That's the argument that Paul is making. And then we see Paul's account beginning in verse 17 down through verse 19. Paul begins with this little word, if. That's an important word. It's a conditional word. 
Paul, again, is not forcing Philemon to do anything, but rather he is encouraging him to do some things. He is certainly factoring in the fact that Philemon has free will and Philemon can do what Philemon wants to do. And Paul's not going to force his hand. But he is going to encourage him to do the right thing. And he's going to make it hard on Philemon to do the wrong thing. And so he says, If thou count me, therefore, a partner, receive him as myself. If thou count me, therefore, a partner. Now I want you to look in verse 1 of what Paul's already said. He says, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy our brother, unto Philemon our dearly beloved, and fellow laborer. So in verse 1, Paul says, I count you as my partner. I count you as my co-worker. But then when we get down to verse 17, he says, If thou count me therefore as a partner. Paul says, I count you that way, but do you count me that way? See, Paul's already laid the foundation for this. He's already said to Philemon, Philemon, we're in this together. We're, we're joined together. And no doubt in verse 1, when Philemon hears those words, that makes Philemon feel good. Paul says that we're co-workers. He says that we're doing the same thing for the Lord. And that would have made Philemon feel very good. But then in verse 17 when he says, If thou count me therefore a partner, the partnership now is on different grounds than it was before. Before he didn't know anything about Onesimus. And he didn't know anything about the purpose or the thrust of this letter. But now he does. Can they be co-workers still? We all know that sometimes the best of friends decide to go into business together. They decide to become co-workers. And so they, they, they put the money in together, they split things, they go into business together. But somewhere over the course of time, that relationship changes. And sometimes partners decide to go separate ways. That happened in Paul's life as well. You recall Paul and Barnabas and John Mark and the situation that developed over that. Here were those who had been partners. Paul and Barnabas had been just like this, side by side working together. But then John Mark, that issue came up. They felt differently about him. And so there was a separation that took place over that matter. Paul took Silas and Barnabas took John Mark. And they went separate ways to do the work that they needed to do for the Lord. And so Paul understands that perhaps Onesimus is going to be that same kind of situation. Paul and Philemon have been partners. But now Onesimus has to be factored into that equation. And sometimes when you factor another person in that equation, it changes things. Last time it was Paul not being able to take John Mark and go with him. This time it may be Philemon not being able to take Onesimus and go with him. And Paul understands that. Paul understands the dynamics of this situation. There are some times when there can be three people who all can be friends. And they can share a relationship with one another and they can go forward. But sometimes when you introduce that third person, the friendship changes. And it makes it harder. We, we perhaps have all known someone who could only have one friend. They couldn't have two friends. They couldn't have three friends. They couldn't be friends with everyone. They could only have one. And it just wouldn't work. And, and, and sometimes it even gets to the point to where they can only have one friend and then that friend can't have any other friends. Now, I'm not saying that's a healthy thing. I'm just saying that's the way it is sometimes. Paul understood that could be the case here. And so he lays it out in a way to let Philemon know, Philemon, it's your choice. If thou count me, therefore, a partner, receive him as myself. Paul says, I hope that you'll take him. And receive him as if you would receive me. Now, imagine that Paul comes to visit Philemon. You think Philemon's going to put Paul out in the slave shed? No. You think Philemon's going to get out his whip? Paul comes? No, not going to do that. You think when, if Paul were coming to visit Philemon, that Philemon would be mean to Paul? No. That wouldn't be the way he would receive him. Paul says, when you see Onesimus coming, I want you to think of him as me. I want you to receive him in the same way you'd receive me. I want you to treat him the same way that you would treat me. I'm asking this. This is, not, well, this is the, the favor that I'm asking of you, is that you will receive him just as you receive me. Now, do you remember in Matthew tw chapter 25, where Jesus is talking about giving water to someone or giving food to someone or giving comfort to someone. He said, Inasmuch as you've done it in the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. Now what Jesus is saying is, when you deal with these individuals, 
I want you to deal with them, and I want you to understand that you're serving me. It's as if you're giving me a drink of water. It's as if if you're giving me food. It's as if you're clothing me. Now, if we can do that, and and granted, that's a hard thing to do, but if we can do that, then it makes it very easy to help those round about us, doesn't it? Because we wouldn't have any difficulty doing those things for Jesus. It wouldn't be too much trouble to do that for Him. It wouldn't be too much effort, whatever the effort's involved in doing that, to do that for Him. We would be glad to do that for Him. We would run to serve Him. And He says, then you treat them the way that you would treat me. But sometimes we we have difficulty looking past what we see and seeing what we ought to see. Um, The disciples did that on occasion. You remember the Samaritan woman who sat down on the edge of the well and Jesus is sitting there talking with her and the disciples come back from getting food. And the disciples are thinking it. They don't say it, thankfully. Thankfully, everything we think doesn't come out of our mouths. Sometimes it does, but thankfully, sometimes we reserve part of that. But they're thinking, why is he talking with her? Doesn't he know who she is? Doesn't he know she's a Samaritan? And doesn't he know, and perhaps maybe even by her dress, you could tell she hadn't been the most moral, upstanding person? Doesn't he know? Doesn't Jesus see that? Doesn't Jesus see what we see? That's what they're thinking. They don't say it. But Jesus knows what knows their thoughts. He knows what they're thinking. He knows our thoughts as well. But here, they had difficulty seeing past the fact that she was the Samaritan. They had difficulty seeing past that she had lived with all of these men. They, they had difficulty seeing past that. And so, had she come to them for help, they could have dismissed her very easily. Because they couldn't see past what they saw on the surface. But Jesus, of course, could with, it, with her and with us. And therefore, he's willing to help. We have to be willing to help, too. And so Paul says, receive him as myself. If he hath wronged thee, or oweth thee aught, put that on mine account. If he hath wronged thee. He again puts this in a conditional sense. But really, there's little doubt about it. Because Paul knows that that Onesimus has wronged Philemon. He belonged to Philemon. Philemon had paid the price to purchase him, and he had run away with himself. He had robbed Philemon of himself. Now, we, we may not like slavery. I don't think Paul liked slavery. But it existed in the first century world. That was with realities. And so Paul says he ran away with himself. He was unprofitable. To you. And think about the fact that when Onesimus ran away, not only did Philemon not have his services, but very likely Philemon had to go and purchase another slave to fill the role that Onesimus would have filled had he been there. And so he's paid this money for this one servant who's run away, and now he's got to pay money for another servant to do that same job. That was difficult. And it was costly for Philemon. Paul understands that. He says, if he hath wronged thee, or oweth thee aught, in all likelihood, in order for Onesimus to make the journey that he did, uh, he had to secure funds in some way to be able to make this journey. Now, as a servant of Philemon, he probably didn't have those funds. And so he had to secure those funds by taking something from Philemon whether it was stealing money from Philemon or stealing something from Philemon that he could then turn into money to pay for his passage. But in all likelihood, he had done that. And Paul realized that, or oweth the alt, put that on my account. I, I love that language, put it on my account. Now, as far as we know, Paul didn't really have an account with Philemon. Paul wasn't keeping up with what Philemon owed him and And Philemon wasn't keeping up with what Paul owed him. That's the way it is with brethren. Brethren do things for one another without keeping an account of that. At least I hope we do. I hope we don't keep account of every time that that we help somebody out. Paul says, put that on my account. Do you remember in, and it really hasn't been that long ago, for some of you, uh, it was a way of life. It may not be as, and, and certainly it isn't a way of life today because uh, people's word isn't their bond anymore. It doesn't mean anything anymore. But probably many of you can remember when you would go to the store and you would get what you needed and they would simply put it on your account. 
And the agreement was you'd pay it when you could. And you'd make payments on it. And they knew you would do it because they knew you were good for it. They, they knew that your name meant something to you. They knew you could be trusted. And so they were willing to allow you to have this, certainly in a farming-based community that was uh, a necessity. You've got to make a crop before you can necessarily pay all these bills. But in order to make a crop, you have to have the seed and have the other things you need. And so that's just the way that the system worked. Well, the system of Paul's day worked in large measure that same way, where you could keep a tab and a person could pay you as they had opportunity, as they could. Uh, sadly, our system isn't that way anymore, but Paul says, put it on my account. I, Paul, have written it with my own hand. Paul says, I've signed for it. Here's my signature. We, we still follow that same practice today, right? Uh, we went to purchase a house or purchase a card. We didn't have the cash money to purchase it. And so we had to sign our name. And today when you do that, guess what you have to do? You even have to sign a form saying that is your name. You have to sign a form saying that is in fact your signature. That, is, that you are who you claim to be because of the dishonesty that exists in our world. And if you've bought a house over the last few years or bought a car over the last few years, the stack of papers has gotten thicker and thicker, right? That you have to sign. Uh, simply because of the dis we, we went from a day and age where you simply gave your word, I'll pay you for this, to now you have to sign form after form after form after form so that there's no way that you can get out of paying uh, that debt because people do that. That's, that's how far we've come. Paul says, if he hath wronged thee or oweth thee all, put that on my account. I, Paul, have written it with my own hand. I will repay it. I will repay it. Here's an IOU from the most honest man in the world. Uh, Philemon knew Paul would pay this debt. Paul says, I've written it, I've signed it, I've made it very, very clear that I will pay you whatever he owes, I will pay you that. And Paul did have money. Paul worked, of course, we know, as a tent maker. He earned money in order to be able to support himself. He, he sometimes received support from brethren and sometimes he did not. And so Paul was a tent making preacher. And we need to have more tent-making preachers today. In fact, I would encourage anyone that is going into preaching today uh, to have something else they can do as well. Uh, we are fastly moving in the direction of it's going to be very difficult for a person to simply preach and to be able to support himself in preaching. There are congregations where you can do that, but there are many congregations where that's not an option anymore and that they need a preacher and you want to preach but you're going to have to work a secular job in order to be able to do that. And that's something that, that those who go into preaching field today ought to prepare themselves to do, is to be able to do something else, whether it's teach school, whether it's sell insurance, uh, whether it's build houses, whatever it is, there needs to be something else that you can do and be able to preach uh, so that these congregations that cannot support a preacher uh, will be able to have a preacher You'll be able to um, help them out in that endeavor. It is good for congregations, of course, to pay a person to preach. And they ought to pay him as much as they can. They ought not to, um, for example, not pay him what he ought to be paid if they have it to pay. But some congregations don't have it to pay. And so a preacher could certainly uh, help those congregations out in that way. It also is a wise thing from a preaching standpoint because of the security uh, that it offers to you. Uh, we are fastly moving to where uh, congregations are less and less receptive to preachers who preach the truth, who preach the whole counsel of God, and who preach against uh, certain sins. And so it would be a good idea for a preacher to be able uh, to have some other way to make a living uh, should he have to do that, either for a short time or for long term, as a result of preaching uh, the truth of God's Word. And so uh, that's something to consider here. But Paul had another job. He had another way of making money. And so he would use that to pay uh, this bill, should it ever come due. I have written it with my own hand. I will repay it, all be it. I do not say to thee, how thou owest unto me, even thine own self besides. Sometimes we say it goes without saying, and then we go on to say it. Now, I know that's not, not what we ought to do, and if you've taken any writing classes, they'll tell you don't, if you don't need to say it, don't say it. Don't use words you don't need to use. They'll teach you the same thing in speaking. But that's something we do. We say, 
I probably don't have to tell you this, but we're going to go ahead and tell them that because we want to remind them. And so that's what Paul's doing right here. Paul says, I know you know this, but and I probably don't need to say it, but I'm going to go ahead and say it. I'm going to go ahead and remind you of it. And that is, I want you to think about what you owe. Anytime somebody owes us something, this ought to be a consideration that comes into mind. Anytime somebody owes us something, we ought to take into consideration, what do I owe? And who do I owe? And it helps us to be far more forgiving and far more merciful. Do you remember in Matthew 18, and we've talked about it before, the unmerciful servant and how that he was forgiven a great debt and then he went out and somebody owed him a small debt and he was unforgiving of that debt? We do that a lot of times. We, we have individuals who owe us a very small amount and we're unforgiving of that debt when we ourselves owe a far greater debt to a far greater master. We owe everything to God and think about the debt that he has forgiven. And we ought to be willing to forgive those who um, owe debts to us. I know that's hard to do and certainly it is their responsibility to try their best to pay those debts. We have to keep that in consideration. And Paul's asking Philemon to keep that in consideration right here. Philemon would not have been a Christian had it not been for Paul. Had it not been for Paul teaching him the truth and bringing him, leading him down that road, Paul wouldn't have been a Christian. And so Philemon owed his very soul to Paul. He owed his spiritual life to Paul. And he ought to be thankful for that. And Paul's trying to factor that in here in getting him to take... Onesimus back. And Paul's pointing out the fact, Philemon, you and Onesimus are on the same ground more than you realize. You see, in the physical world, it was master-slave. But in the spiritual world, it was brothers in Christ. In the spiritual world, it was servants of the same master. They were on the same. That's what the point of Galatians chapter 3, the end of that chapter, is all about. There's no more male nor female, bond nor slave in Christ. All are one in Christ. You see, everything's been leveled out on the spiritual plane. And Philemon needed to understand that. Just as Paul had converted him, Paul had converted Onesimus. Onesimus owed Paul the same debt that Philemon owed him. They both were indebted to Paul. And Paul hoped that they both would realize the debt that they owed and work together to bring about the proper end to this. Now, take a look at the next context, and that's Paul's assurance, or Paul's anticipation, verses 20 through 22. It says, Yea, brother, let me have joy of thee in the Lord. Refresh my bowels in the Lord. Having confidence in thy obedience, I wrote unto thee, knowing that thou wilt also do more than I say. But with all, prepare me also a lodging, for I trust that through your prayers I shall be given unto you. Yea, brother. Now, think about how many times in this little postcard Paul has brought up this fact of being brethren. You go all the way back to Genesis chapter 13 with Abraham and Lot, and you remember there was a strife that developed between the herdsmen of Abraham and the herdsmen of Lot. It wasn't yet between Abraham and Lot, although it was definitely headed that direction because their servants were involved. And eventually it would have gotten to them. But do you remember what Paul, what Abraham said to Lot? Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, for we be brethren. He says, we're brethren. We're brothers. There doesn't need to be any strife between us. There's a pagan world that's watching us, and they're watching how we deal with one another, and we don't want to bring a reproach upon God, and so we need to get along. There shouldn't be any strife between us. Whatever is wrong between us, we, we need to solve that. And Abraham's solution was, we need to separate. You need to pick what you want and go in that direction. I'll pick what I want and I'll go in this. We'll still be close to one another, but we won't be together anymore. Because there's too much strife when we're together. We do that with our children, right? Children get to fussing with one another. What do we do? You go there, you go here, right? You can't be in the same room together. You can't get along. Now, sometimes you're on a trip in the back seat of a car, and you can't separate them very much. But if you're at home, you can say, you go to your room, you go to your room. 
Give them time apart, and then perhaps when they come back together, they can get along. Paul understood that, and Paul understood the, the problem that existed right here, and he's trying to solve that problem. Abraham understood that problem. He understood the problem that existed, and so he gave some space, but he brought up this matter of brethren and being brethren. Here Paul says, yea, brother. He's already called. Onesimus his brother. Now he calls Philemon his brother. There's not to be any strife between any of them. Let me have joy of thee in the Lord. Let me have. Paul has brought out the fact, number one, he's aged, he's old. And he hopes that Philemon will have some sympathy because of his age. But he also has brought out the fact that he's a prisoner. And he hopes that Philemon will have some sympathy on him because he's a prisoner. He brings that up again here. He says, let me have joy. Literally, Philemon, I don't have a whole lot in life to bring joy to me right now. But it would bring great joy to me if you would do this. If you'd do the right thing, that would bring joy to me. You wouldn't be adding sorrow upon sorrow. You wouldn't be adding more problems in my life. But rather, you'll be relieving some of that if you'll do the right thing. We have to consider how our actions will affect um, someone else. And so he says, Yea, brother, let me have joy of thee. This word joy, is it comes from the same root word as Onesimus. Now, you remember that the name Onesimus meant profitable. And so let's read it that way. Yea, brother, let me have profit of thee in the Lord. Paul has told Philemon, when Onesimus comes home, he will be profitable to you. He will bring profit to you. Now, Paul turns that around and he says, you, you bring profit to me. Here was your servant who ran away and you didn't have him. Paul says, I found him. And I sent him back to you. I have given you back what was lost. I have profited you in sending him home. Now, you profit me. And treating him the right way. You see how it works. Paul has a responsibility, but Philemon also has a responsibility. Onesimus has a responsibility. We all have responsibilities in relationships. Sometimes we don't deal with relationships that way. Sometimes we expect the other person to do everything. And that's often the case when we're trying to deal with a reconciliation and we're trying to get two people back together again. So often one person thinks the other person is totally 100% at fault. They have to do everything. And they're unwilling to compromise. They're unwilling to meet in the middle. They're unwilling to come together. Paul understands that all of them have to make some concessions here. And he's asking Philemon to do that. He says, refresh my bowels in the Lord. Notice the emphasis, in the Lord, in the Lord. Paul is trying to get Philemon to get out of this physical realm. In the physical world, Philemon can treat Onesimus any way he wants to. Slaves basically had no rights. And so he could take Onesimus back or not take him back. He could crucify him. He could do anything he wanted to. And the Roman world would support him in doing that. Other slave owners would support him in doing that. But Paul says, Philemon, we don't just live in the physical world. We live in a spiritual world. We have responsibilities on a higher plane. And he says, in the Lord, I want you to give me profit. In the Lord, I want you to refresh me. I'm asking for you to take that in consideration when you do this. It says in verse 21, Having confidence in thy obedience, I wrote unto thee, knowing that thou wilt also do more than I say. Confidence in thy obedience. I do not believe, on a general, as a general rule, that we have enough confidence in our brothers and sisters in Christ. I don't think we do. I don't think we have enough confidence in people. And I think that shows, and I think we get kind of what we expect to get as a result of that. If you go and visit someone who's erring, and you go to visit them with the anticipation, with the idea they're not going to change, they're not going to come back, you don't think that, that comes across? You don't think it comes across maybe in the way you go and the way you handle yourself while you're there, and maybe they can read that? Maybe they, they could pick up on that when you're even there with them. 
And I know we've all been let down, and I know that there will be times in the future when we'll be let down, and I know that we'll go with full confidence. They're going to do what's right. If I go and talk to them and I go and lay things out for them, they're going to do that. I know that there are times when they're going to let us down. I've had people tell me, you've had people, I'll be there Sunday. And then Sunday rolled around, they weren't there. Or I, I know I've got to do better, I'm going to do better, and then they didn't. We've all had that. But that's on them. What's on us is whether or not we go to them with that kind of confidence. Radio preaching is a hard type of preaching, in, in my opinion. And it's hard for this reason. You don't have an audience. There's no one out there. You, you can't pick up from the audience. You can't see how they're responding. And you can't adjust according to how they're responding. And so it, it's, it's harder to preach on the radio because you don't have that audience right there in front of you. But what they teach you is when you preach on the radio, you have to smile when you're preaching. You say, why are you smiling? There's nobody out there to see. But it affects, it affects the way you speak. And it affects the way they receive you. And so you have, and it's kind of, it's, it's that anticipation, it's that idea of going with confidence and approaching it in a certain way and expecting results from that. We often get what we expect. And if we expect a lot, we often get a lot. We have to go to people with confidence. Now we have to understand that the gospel is powerful, Romans 1.16. It's the power of God and salvation. It's powerful. It can change lives. Sometimes we doubt the power that it has because we, we preach it w with the idea in the back of our minds, they're not really going to accept it. They're not really going to change. They're not really going to do anything about it. And when we do that, we probably get what we expect to get. Paul doesn't approach Philemon that way. He has confidence in his obedience. I wrote unto thee, knowing that thou wilt also do more than I say. Have you thought about how hard it would be for Philemon to do more than what Paul said? Paul was already asking a lot. Paul was asking the unheard of in that first century world to take this runaway slave back as a brother, to make him more than a servant. He was already asking. Some have suggested, here's what Paul's asking. Paul is asking for Philemon to make Onesimus his son. Paul's already done that. Paul said, he is my son. Now he's asking Philemon to do the same thing. Philemon, you adopt him. You take him into your family. You make him family, not just serving anymore. He's a different person. I'm asking you. That, that's how Philemon could have done more than what Paul asked him to do. And that would be a very, very hard thing to do. But when you understand the spiritual realm, is it that hard? Because what did we do? ran away and we're begging to God. Heard the gospel, we came back home. How did God take us back? He took us back as a son. He adopted us. Gave us the full rights of inheritance. Gave us all the privileges of being a son. He didn't have to do that, but that's what he did. He did more than what he had to do. And Paul's asking Philemon to do more than he has to do. It says in verse 22, But with all, prepare me also a lodging, for I trust that through your prayers I shall be given unto you. Again, there's this added incentive. Philemon, I know you've been praying for my release. And it may very well be that I will be released, and if so, then I'm, I'll come see you. So you get a room ready. Uh, again, Paul is approaching Philemon with confidence. I believe that you will do this. I believe that you'll do more than I say. And now here, Paul is asking Philemon to pray with confidence for his release. Sometimes we deal with people with a terminal illness. A doctor's told them there's no hope. But we're Christians. And so we know that we have a power supply that doctors don't have, don't know about, maybe don't want to know about. We know that, and I'm not talking about a miracle, but I am talking about the providential care of God. And I'm talking about the answer of prayer. Here, here's someone that you love that has a terminal illness, but you're praying for them. Can you really pray for them 
and not pray with confidence? Can you really pray for them saying, they've got this, and the doctors say there's nothing that can be done, there's no changing it, there's no cure for it. In order to be able to pray for them properly, you've got to put that out of your mind. And you've got to pray believing. You've got to pray with the full confidence that God has the power to change things. And if you can't pray that way, if we don't pray with faith, if we don't pray believing, then we don't have any reason to believe that that prayer will be answered. But if we pray believing, then there is reason for us to expect that something might be done. Praying with confidence. And here Paul has this confidence of him. And knowing that Paul might come to visit him certainly would affect how Philemon would treat Onesimus. If he kills Onesimus and Paul comes to visit, Paul's first question is going to be, where's Onesimus? Well, Paul, you know, he ran away. You know what he did? I crucified him. Paul comes to visit Philemon. Where's Onesimus? He's back in that shed back there. I keep him chained up all the time. It would affect the way Philemon would treat him. Think about it as well, the last couple of verses, because we want to move on. It says, There salute the Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus. Paul again brings up the fact that he's a prisoner. Marcus, Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas, my fellow laborers. He brings up the fact that he has other co-workers, not just Philemon. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. He brings up this partnership that he has with grace and with Jesus and he asked for it to be with his spirit. Now, when you ask for it to be with your spirit, think about Colossians 3. Think about Ephesians 4, where Paul's instructions are, Be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. Those are all have to do with the spirit. That's what he's asking of Philemon, is for him to have a gracious spirit. And if he'll have a gracious spirit, then Paul's confident of what he will do with Onesimus. Thank you very much for your attention. Lord willing, we'll begin next time uh, with the postcard of Jude.